One second, let me find the uh, cursor. Yeah. One second, AJ. Oh, it's up there. The cursor's not moving. <laughs> well, we are live now, so I've got to welcome the audience. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for Rewind Your Body Clock with Janie Garler. Today, she is joined by a very special guest, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and they'll be discussing weight gain, chronic fatigue, exhaustion, hormonal health, and the effects of sleep deprivation. Please welcome them both to the show at the same place at the same time. <laughs> Thank you so much, AJ. It's an absolute delight to be with you. Um, it's such a pleasure as well, because I finally managed to get to the States uh, to see my honey. And uh, so we thought we'd just give you a sort of like a double, a, a double whammy. What do you reckon, <laughs> Frank? A double whammy? Is yeah, we, we rarely end up in the same place at the same time. So here we are in South Florida together. So we're doing a mutual show. and We're so excited to be here. Yeah. So we're talking about sleep, as you said, and uh, both of us, uh, you know, obviously Frank's uh, just about to publish his latest book and my latest book. I, I've got a whole chapter dedicated to sleep, as I think you have, Frank, because it is such an important topic. It is absolutely crucial for health and well-being, mentally, emotionally, physically, the whole gamut of every health concern is underpinned by Having good sleep, wouldn't you agree? Yes, absolutely. It, it, sleep deficiency is kind of intriguing because it's one of those uh, biological requirements that we seem too often wanting to just apologize for, which is kind of intriguing. You know, I use the image of, you know, if you went to a dinner party and you got just enough to eat at the dinner party, would you get up and apologize for having enough to eat? You wouldn't do that. But, you know, if you were sleeping and somebody awakened you and they realized that maybe you were sleeping and they said, were you just sleeping? You would do like, oh, no, not me. No, no, I don't sleep. I wasn't and, asleep. I yeah. wasn't asleep. No. So it's almost <laughs> something we apologize for. But yet it's one of the most profound biological requirements of health and sleep deficiency, as we'll talk about today, has huge ramifications in everything from um, you know, obesity, weight gain, addiction, uh, heart attacks, diabetes, heart attacks, and the like. So and the psychological aspects yes, and, of and anxiety, and depression, and so on. So, you know, it's something that we need to really address more emphatically. And we'll also be giving you some really great sleep techniques and uh, tips that are really actionable and easy to implement right away. So this is a, a really informative session, but it's also highly practical as well. Yeah, I, you know, we, we live we live in a culture that teeters on the edge of exhaustion, as most people know. You know, with all the stuff we have going on with work and families and all the demands, we're not burning the candle out at both ends. We're cutting it in three or four places and burning it out at six, eight, and ten ends. But then instead of getting the only remedy for exhaustion, which is sleep, what do we do? We look for all the manners of stimulants and, you know, stimulant uh uh, stimulation so that we can bypass this very fundamental need. And by doing that, we only reinforce the process of exhaustion even further. So um, as simple as this idea of sleep is, it is probably one of the most misunderstood in the overall picture of holistic health care. This is an important topic. What is your new book called, Dr. Frank? The new book is called, just like my old topic of the title, Weightless, Compassionate Weight Loss for Life. It really is probably the most comprehensive uh, evidence-based book on dealing with the pandemic of personal and global obesity because it covers everything from environmental stuff to addiction to nutrition to all the factors that we know are essential uh, for nutrition. So it's a global big picture book uh, that people typically overlook because they don't realize that factors other than food are often some major factors related to obesity and weight gain. And sleep is one of these, by the way. It's a major, major piece in the obesity story. And it's one that can be very easily overlooked because very few people really speak about it. Do you have a release date yet for the book? No, I don't. It's actually being edited carefully right now. Uh, you know what? I had written most of it a while back and I sat on it and I, I just needed to be provoked. And what I did is I brought it into modern context after sitting on it for a few years, and then I just want to get it out. And so uh, 
I don't have a publisher or any of that, but I'm getting it fine. If I have to self-publish, I will. So whatever it is, it is. Yeah, his editors are completely blown away, AJ. Um, I mean, I've I've seen I've seen a lot of the chapters, and I have to say it's it's going it's going to be a game changer. Literally, it's <laughs> no really, pun intended. It's, it will be a game it's changer. It's really a sum total of my 45 years of working with people with weight issues. And so it really, I put it all in one book in case I just die tomorrow. You know how that is. I want it all out there in one book. <laughs> well, let us know when it comes out. We'll, we'll, we'll announce it. <laughs> of course, it. of course. So back to sleep. Um, I think one of the things that we really wanted to touch on is uh, weight gain. Um, yeah. So the connection between adiposity and lack of sleep uh, and, and so on. Um, I think one of the first things that we do need to touch on is that when we miss sleep, what tends to happen is that we start to produce hormone mess messenger hormones that actually drive our cravings for fatty, sugary foods. Uh, we produce a hormone called ghrelin, which drives our appetite. And so when that's happening, our impetus, it was a survival mechanism, obviously, millennia ago. But uh, now what happens is that if you miss sleep, you are driven to go and hunt out those sorts of foods. Um, and so that's just one part of the picture. But as we know, what actually happens when we're starting to gain weight, especially around the middle and one of the other problems with the lack of sleep is i know frank will speak to this is the idea that we also have not regulation in the production of cortisol which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine hormonal messenger so all of these things tend to start to pack fat on and adiposity on around the middle and around our internal organs uh, the viscera so we get this in, in, increase in visceral fat now what we know about that is it drives chronic inflammation and for everybody who's been following this series we know that chronic inflammation underpins all of the illnesses the chronic diseases we wrongly associate with being a natural part of the aging process they absolutely aren't so frank can i pass um over to you to talk a little bit more about the impact of lack of sleep on and weight gain yeah let's talk about that you know the the evidence base that to start off with in some of the one of the largest epidemiological studies I saw with over 70,000, mostly women, you know, uh, people sleeping less than six hours a night compared to people sleeping more than seven. So like five hours and, and less had a significant increase in body mass index and obesity. So there's huge relationship between the amount of time of sleep and the outcome of obesity, both in adults and children, by the way. And uh, we find that people sleeping less than six hours can have as much as a two and a half fold increase in the risk of diabetes, for example. So we know that there are impacts of sleep deficiency on insulin and so on. So the, the data on you know, sleep deficiency related to obesity is a huge volume of data. I just want people to understand that because we're not quoting all those studies here, but the evidence base is profound. But when there is sleep deficiency, there are four things that hormonally occur that become significant to discuss. Number one is that sleep deficiency is perceived by the body as a major stressful event. And I think people don't realize that because it seems like you're doing nothing, it has very little impact. But as it turns out, the body interprets it as if you're being attacked by a tiger. And so the first thing that happens is your adrenal system which is the, are the glands of stress, release the hormone called cortisol. Now, cortisol, of course, is the kind of the mediator of stress response and the fight or flight response of the body, but it has some huge impact in relationship to obesity. Cortisol has a love affair, an affinity for fat cells around the abdominal region. You know, in the body, there's an enzyme that produces fat called lipoprotein lipase. Cortisol not only stimulates this hormone, but it actually stimulates the genetic production of this protein hormone. So that kind of stress, that sleep deficiency is programming this remarkable increase in abdominal belly fat. And that's linked to, as Janie said, risk factors for diabetes and heart disease. You know, historically, that was the male pattern of weight gain. Men got that I call it the Milwaukee goiter. They got that belly that dripped over both sides of the belt. And women had more of the hippie kind of saddlebaggy hormonal kind of weight gain. But, you know, while women may not have caught up with equal pain in the marketplace, they caught up with equal stress. 
And we see as much abdominal belly fat weight gain now in the female population. And it's intriguing that with that, the death and risk of heart disease in women has now equaled men when in the past it didn't. So cortisol is triggering this really relentless increase in body fat. And not only that, cortisol dramatically increases inflammation and urges the body to produce less natural antioxidants that help with free radical damage in the body, which is tied into aging and weight gain. So it creates what we call oxidative stress that also interferes with many cellular functions, but especially obesity and aging. So cortisol is one piece. The second thing that the uh, sleep deficiency does is it triggers something that we call insulin resistance, which has been talked about many times. And we know that the body regulates blood sugar by releasing insulin, which attaches to receptors on muscle and brain and liver cells and allows cells to open their doors and allow sugar to enter so the cells can produce energy. The problem is when insulin or when those receptors for insulin are altered, like by high fat diets, and in this case, lack of sleep, we find that we have a remarkable interference with sugar entering cells, so cells can be starved for sugar. So guess what's gonna happen with insulin resistance? Remarkable craving for all kinds of garbagey, refined processed foods and sugars. And more than that, now blood sugar levels will go up and the body will try to protect us against the damaging effects of elevated blood sugar by storing it as fat. So again, contributes to this process of obesity. And so you get this craving and it's intriguing because in studies that have been done on people with sleep deficiency, if they put out a food bar with all of these options, healthy and non-healthy foods, people will gravitate to most of the processed food especially refined sugary processed foods because of that insulin resistant effect. And then the last two things Jenny hinted at one was the release of a hormone from the stomach called ghrelin, which is released as an appetite stimulant. And so if you think about it, when we need food, we have to have something that drives us to go get it. So ghrelin is released from the stomach, sign signals appetite, and we go and get food. But if all we had was something that stimulated food use, there would be no break to that and we would all be obese in a matter of minutes. So there has to be something that gives us feedback to stop eating. And there is something released from fat cells called leptin. And leptin will be released from fat cells, travel back to the brain and give your brain the signal that you've had enough to eat. It's intriguing. Women who, uh, studies that have been done on women and men sleeping five hours a night compared to women and men sleeping seven to eight, we see about a 15% increase in the chemical that stimulates appetite, ghrelin, and about a 15 to 20% decrease in leptin that gives you the signal to stop. So in short, you don't stop. You tend to overeat on a hormonal level. So we see changes with cortisol, we see changes with insulin resistance, we see changes with ghrelin and leptin, and intriguingly, the sleep deficiency also, especially in combination with the kinds of foods that we have spoken against, foods that are loaded with salt, oil, and sugar, and more from processed and animal sources, create something called leptin resistance, like insulin resistance, where that leptin released from fat cells that travels back to the brain to give you a signal to stop eating, the brain no longer recognizes that. In fact, there's a, 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 a miscommunication that now will occur. And so the, the brain is resistant to the communication, the signal of leptin to stop eating, and you will overeat. So sleep deficiency has all of that impact. And, and we need to really understand that at a deep hormonal level, it's programming all of those changes. I think also it's worth talking about the uh, psychological impact of lack of sleep. Uh, the nurses study, which is a very famous study, nursesstudy.org, if you want to go and take a look at the actual core research, uh, it showed that when we lack sleep, what actually tends to happen is that we make horror judgments. Um, but more than that, we make mistakes. So it's often noted that uh, catastrophic events, um, bus crashes and, and things like that often occur when perhaps the driver has, uh, has been sleep deprived. But also it was noted amongst the nurses in the study that 
they were less likely to make um, good judgments when it came to medication. So they were making medication errors, but even more impactful was that they didn't actually necessarily, they, they weren't necessarily bothered by that. So they were, they knew that they were making errors, but they were less likely to want to check those uh, those medications and and those and and sort of were realizing that the errors were occurring, but they weren't that bothered by it. Um, it's also been noted that we are less likely to be honest uh, when we're sleep deprived. Um, we we lie more readily. We 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 may steal more readily. So it's you know when we see that we're living in this twenty four seven always on society, moral judgment is also being extremely compromised, and it's something that's a part of the picture that very few people actually know very much about or are aware of so you know it's just such a huge you know sleep sleep deprivation and the importance of sleep is is such a huge topic so um what else can we talk about frank i should talk about uh, some of the uh, the best ways of actually getting sleep um well yeah let, let's talk about let's get into the idea of when you're not paying attention to the need for sleep you know, you're looking at all these other factors to mm. compensate for that exhaustion. And I think in conditions of chronic fatigue and, and other kinds of things, you know, when we talk, we, we've talked about stress before, and we've talked about the general response to stress, the third phase of it, when you allow stress to continue chronically is the factor of exhaustion. And that exhaustion is, is a very typical part of our culture, as we addressed at the very beginning. But instead of taking the time for rest and sleep, we look for all kinds of stimulant abuses to kind of compensate for that, whether it's caffeine, chocolate, sugar, whatever the case may be. And, and I always like to hammer home to people that, you know, many years ago, Dr. Shelton, one of the hygienic uh, mentors of the natural health movement in the United States, talked about something he called the law of dual effect. And that means anytime you stimulate the body in any chemical way, that stimulation is only the initial effect. As the body handles that substance, you have to crash to the same extent that you've been stimulated. So people get lost in the initial effect. You know, we get that little boost. What they're not realizing is that the follow-up to that is rebound depression and exhaustion. And I mean on a physiological and on a mental and psychological level. And you can make the case that a lot of depression, anxiety, and a lot of what's going on in mental health, as well as physical exhaustion, chronic fatigue, and the like, is being reinforced by this mentality of stimulation, trying to circumvent and dance around our factors of exhaustion. We need to know that there's a time when you need to surrender. And you need to just really give into that biological requirement. And, 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 and it's very problematic because um, to understand the impact of the stimulants, not only does it create exhaustion, but it creates effects on the sleep cycle. And maybe we can just touch on that mm, briefly. Yeah. You know, when, when you go into sleep, there's, a, there's an initial to the beginning of sleeplessness. Then what happens is you go into deeper and deeper waves into like stage three and four sleep where you're going into deep delta waves. In that deep phase of sleep is where most of the recovery and repair of cells is happening. It's where bones are being repaired and where tissues and muscles are growing and, and being able to sustain themselves. And then once you get through those four phases of that initial non-REM sleep, then you get into what's called the REM phase where there's some dreaming and all of that. But the, that deeper phase happens about an hour and a half after when you first ease into sleep. And the bottom line is so much of the magic of repair that sleep provides happens in those deeper phases. It's very intriguing that the things people use like caffeine, uh, as much as those things create certain effects, whether they stimulate you or whether they knock you out in the case of alcohol, they all interfere with those deeper phases of regenerative sleep. And it's very important to understand that. And that's why, you know, with alcohol, you can get knocked out drinking at night, but it's amazing. You can be in bed for 15 hours and wake up exhausted because you've totally interfered with these deeper phases of sleep. And, um, it's intriguing. What I tell people is that with caffeine, it's very intriguing. In studies done, caffeine has a pretty long half-life. 
in studies that have been done where people have taken a, just marginal caffeine, even three and more than six hours before sleep, uh, the caffeine has interrupted the sleep cycle and disturbed those deeper phases of sleep. And it's important to realize that we're, we're diurnal animals. We're not nocturnal. We're, there's no vampires in the human population. We're designed to get up, wake up in the daylight and go to sleep in the dark. And we're designed to do very little at night other than prepare for sleep. But if you think about it, think about how much people carry the stress of the day to bed with them at night. Think about how much food can often be consumed at night when we should be eating very lightly. Some people do heavy, heavy exercise late at night. So we've, in a way, we reverse this cycle. One of the things I like about, you know, systems like yoga and Tai Chi, these kind of, these kind of uh, cultivation systems is they get you back in touch with the light dark cycle. The fact that we are these beautiful diurnal animals and we need to respect that but we live in a culture that has disengaged us from that. So um, we need to, you need, if you're having trouble with sleep, you need to get rid of all stimulant abuses. You have to allow the system to naturally wind down. And at night, you need to let the stress of the day, you know, go away. That's why, you know, the things you teach, you could probably address that. Yeah. You know, you want to, all of that fight or flight is what we call sympathetic activity. You know, this raw. And what happens is at night, many people have what the Buddhists call monkey mind. You know, it never stops uh, these barrels of monkeys. So you got to create that parasympathetic, soothing, relaxing approach as you're easing into sleepless sleepfulness. And uh, Janie can talk about things like yoga nidra and other things, breathing. And yes. all of that has benefit to kind of help us start to ease in rather than looking for these other forms, and, and I'll address even medication, but look, why don't you address that yes, as we talk about that? Yes, indeed. So, so one of the best exercise, well, there are, there are two great exercises that I want to share today. Uh, the second one is the Yoga Nidra, uh, which is a, a, a meditation, a guided meditation, which we'll talk about in a moment. But uh, first of all, um, what we'll talk about is a breathing exercise called the 478 technique. Um, it was popularized quite a lot on, online um, just over the last year or so, really. Um, but the, it's very, very simple. It's, it's deceptively simple. And it just seems as though it's this is so easy. How could it possibly work? But I promise you it does. What it does is it shifts us from being in a sympathetic nervous system dominant mode to a parasympathetic uh, nervous system. It shifts us into our rest and digestion digest mode, which is what we need in order to be able to drift off to sleep. So the idea with this exercise is that you breathe in for a count of four, and the counts are down to you yourself. It doesn't have to be, you know, sort of one, one count per second or anything like that. And you can actually slow your counts down. But you breathe in for a count of four, and you then hold for a count of seven. And then you breathe out slowly for a count of eight. Now, here's the trick, though. So this comes from a very, very ancient Ayurvedic technique. And in yogic techniques, one of the best ways of getting ourselves into this parasympathetic dominance is by putting the tip of our tongue just on the roof of the mouth, just behind our front teeth. So you breathe in, one, you hold for seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then as you breathe out, you'll breathe out with your mouth open and your tongue just behind your front teeth for a count of eight. So it sounds like this. So it, it does make a whooshing sound. So if you get that whooshing sound, you're not doing it wrong, you're doing it absolutely right. So just four rounds of that technique has been shown to really, really work. It, that's the thing that we need to do to shift ourselves into rest and digest mode. As I say, deceptively simple, but it works an absolute treat. And then the next thing, which you'll find on my website, it's such an important uh, gui guided meditation that I've made it available as a free download. It's called the Yoga Nidra Meditation. Now, Yoga Nidra is, again, a very ancient Ayurvedic technique or Vedic technique that is millennia old. And what you do is you it's like a body scan type of meditation that you may well be familiar with. 
but it's slightly different insofar as it moves around the body, but a lot faster. So I talk you through where to place your attention throughout your body as we go through. But the, one of the marked differences between a normal body scan and yoga nidra is that you set an intention for the, for the session. The session itself only needs to last for about 20 minutes, but it is said in Vedic th theory that just 20 minutes of yoga nidra is the equivalent to two hours of deep restorative sleep. Now that's the key, restorative sleep. That's where we really, you know, that's what we need to really be getting for ourselves. The problem, as Frank was just saying, is that if we're not dipping into those really deep levels of sleep and then rising up again for a little bit of dream state, REM sleep, and then going back down into sort of theta, delta theta brainwave sleep, sleep patterns. We're not getting that uh, cleansing. We're not, our brains are not processing. We're not dealing with the events of the previous day uh, that we deal with in REM sleep and so on. So this technique can really help to facilitate that. It's an ideal technique that will help you get to sleep. But if you wake up in the middle of the night, as so many of us do, you just pop this recording on. As I say, it's gifted to you with my blessing. Just download it, share it with your friends. You can use this to go back to sleep as well if you're one of those night or even early morning wakers. So please do make use of that. I've had amazing responses to it. People absolutely love it. You know, there were a couple of things. Uh, we, we talked about the rhythms of light and dark, you know, day and night, the diurnal rhythm. It's interesting that we are very ritualistic animals, and there are data that suggest that if we create a ritual of winding down at nighttime, where you have more consistent times that you go to bed and more consistent times that you wake up, there was a huge study done on college-age women who showed that those that had created this ritual of preparing the winding down at a certain time and waking up at a certain time, actually were able to get eight to eight and a half hours of sleep a night compared to people who did not do that, same age, same groups. So we are very ritualistic and there's something that the body will respond to that ritual of creating our a routine winding down and a routine waking up time. Uh, and that's very, very useful. But the, tr the true point is we have to respect that nighttime is truly a time of winding down. That's why we see people that have shift hours, like shift workers and so on, they have huge problems with obesity and health because the body is not geared to having to be kind of shifted around all of those changing. It's almost like shifting time zones for the body while you're still in the same time zone. You're just creating this disconnection from the ritual of light and dark. And the other thing is physical activity. You know, people that exercise more routinely typically do sleep better. Uh, one of the transmitters that's involved with sleep is, of course, the transmitter, neurotransmitter called serotonin, which is involved, uh, and the amino acid tryptophan, which is involved with making that neurotransmitter. Well, it turns out that activity raises that transmitter, the actual amount of that, on an ongoing basis. So what you create in the daytime will also affect the sleeping pattern at night. So I urge people to be you know, more vigorous in their physical activity. There's a link between those two. And it's kind of also an intrigue. The benefit of your exercise is also linked with the sleeping pattern and the, and the pattern of your sleep. For example, we know that children need about nine to 10 hours of sleep compared to adults that can do well on six to eight. So the question is why? Well, children into adulthood right up until the early 20s are still going through growing. They're still developing and growing. And we know when that's happening, they're releasing a hormone called growth hormone. Well, growth hormone peaks. Fear with those deeper phases of sleep, you interfere with growth hormone release. Now, it is true that after the age of 30, as adults, we don't release that hormone as much, but we still do release it. So, you know, when I deal with people that say, you know what, I'm working out, I'm pushing my weights, I'm pushing the workout, and I don't seem to be getting the results in muscle mass. And so, and I'll say, well, you know, they say, I just need to work out harder and more. And I say, no, you don't. What you need to do is you need to rest and gather that sleep phase. 
because it's in that delta wave phase of sleep that not only do you release growth hormone, but you involve muscle repair, muscle growth, and all of that. So even as an adult, even though we're not releasing growth hormone like children and adolescents, we're still releasing some that's a response to our physical activity programs, and our results can often be tied to factors of exhaustion. And I see that a lot. And we can only get better results by doing more, 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 more. And we're not really replenishing and allowing those phases of sleep to do their magic because that's where the growth and that's where the recovery occurs. And it's in those deeper wave phases of sleep as you get into stage three. An impact on the benefits of exercise and the results that we get from the exercise that we do. I think also it's worth mentioning um, that recent research has actually discovered that if we are sleep deprived, we do end up getting uh, telomere shortening. We, st we don't uh, produce as much telomerase, which of course is involved in maintaining the length of telomeres. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge uh, anti, there's a huge sort of anti-aging or sort of age rewind component to getting adequate sleep as well. So, sorry, what you said? Uh, you may want to explain what those are. Not everybody may know what a telomere, telomere well, is. Well, I think everybody that's been watching this for a while, oh, actually, okay. yeah, well, I've, okay. I've, I've, I've gone into, but for those of you who don't know, and, and for those of you new uh, to this uh, broadcast is that telomeres are the little caps on the ends of our chromosomes um, that they're a little bit like the little plastic bit on the end of your shoelace that you have that stops the shoelace from unraveling that little cap called an aglet so we have these little caps on the ends of our chromosomes and you can measure those and those will give you a sort of an equivalent of what's known as a biological age. So you can measure them and sort of roughly work out uh, whether somebody is maintaining their biological age. Now, biological age, of course, is different to our chronological age. Our chronological age is the age we are in years, the number of times we've been around the sun and so on. Our biological age is how old we are as far as our biological systems are concerned. Um, and it it, it, it can be measured. The way the measurement is usually taken, because it's ubiquitous, it's, it's found sort of all, almost everywhere throughout the body, is through our measuring our white blood cells, measuring uh, the, the chromosomes, uh, the, the caps on the ends of our chromosomes and our white blood cells. So if you monitor those in certain groups of really well-matched people, you can actually see whether particular interventions, such as people who are you know, doing particular things to manage their stress response or people who are eating well, people who are socializing and all of those wonderful things that we've spoken about over the last six months all of those uh, can be measured and you can work out whether those interventions actually preserve or even lengthen telomeres and it has been found just not so long ago that good sleep good restorative sleep deep sleep actually helps to preserve and even lengthen telomeres. So from that perspective, we can actually consider it to be a, an age rewind strategy. So there is that element to it as well. It keeps us happier, healthier, and actually not just biologically younger, but actually looking younger. Um, people do look haggard if they haven't slept. And, you know, there are so many reasons why the hormonal imperative and all of the other things that we've spoken about. I'm going to have a sip of my water. I, 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 I have a question. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you were talking about how shift workers, uh, they struggle because it's not with yes. their natural circadian rhythms. And we recently had Dr. Lyle on the show and he got some people angry when he talked about intermittent fasting, not being as big of a deal as people made it because um, he feels that, that when you eat isn't as important as what you eat and things like that. But I'm curious with intermittent fasting, what I hear at least from the Adventist doctors is they really believe that if, if it's, it's got to be done breakfast and lunch. But most people that I know have an easier time doing it lunch and dinner because dinner is a time, you know, the only time maybe you have right. to sit down with your family. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Is, is the most important thing for somebody that chooses intermittent fasting, which meals or just that they're limiting the feeding window? You know, it's funny. When you look at a lot of the data on intermittent fasting, what really sticks out, because a lot of times people are doing it for weight regulation as a rule. What has typically been shown is that people on intermittent fasting are typically restricting calories is really what happens. So it's not so much that the time frame has been the magic. The fact of the matter is, is that they've basically done some calorie restriction. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I, I don't disagree with Doug in the sense that I think some, sometimes much ado has been made more than it probably should. But yeah. 
here's the real benefit for me. And in a way, I agree with the Adventists in this regard. We're making the point that we are diurnal animals that need to be winding down in the dark. So we're not meant to eat a lot of food in the darkness. We're not meant to do a lot of physical activity late in the day. The digestive fires definitely burn earlier in the day. If you can get your biggest meal midday, that probably, or earlier in the day, that probably would be a major benefit and having a lighter amount of calories later. So in your model, if you ate lunch and dinner, I would still make the dinner lighter and have more calories earlier in my intermittent period. But I do believe that by the intermittent fasting really connects you to the diurnal rhythm of not eating at nighttime which is such a big piece because if you think about it, think about how many people go out for big dinners at late at night. I mean, I grew up in New York City. That was typical. You know, you would eat late. And, and, and so the bottom line is I like the I, I like intermittent fasting because of the way it hooks you back into the rhythm. But I don't want people to look at it as this, you know, this magical thing that, you know, oh, my God, this is what I need to do for weight regulation. It is about what you eat and how much you eat also. But it does hook you back into a better rhythm. And I really like that about it. It's, you make a good point, though, that really at the end of the day for people doing it for weight loss, it's the, the, the less time you spend eating, the less you're probably going to eat, regardless. That's, of right. That's eat. right. That makes and, sense. And, and, and again, for sleep purposes, I, I do like that idea of having a space of at least two to three hours between the last time you ate and when you go to bed. But I'm going to make a comment about that because this is something that came out by an endocrinologist, Richard Wortman, up at MIT years ago. There are people, whether it's because of adrenal stress or whether it's because of whatever, can have some um, hypoglycemic episodes that happen during their sleep phase where blood sugar levels are not maintained as well. And he made the point that having something a little closer to bedtime, something very simple like fruit, couple of pieces of fruit or pieces of fruit would actually improve their sleep pattern. And here's the, one of the reasons why. Uh, we talked about insulin playing a role in helping sugar enter cells. What people don't realize is that insulin also plays a role in helping amino acids of protein enter cells. It's not just about sugar. So if you think about tryptophan being an essential amino acid in the protein we're eating, even in plant protein, which is gonna be a major part of serotonin production. Wortman's idea was that by having that little bit of fruit, it allows tryptophan to enter more successfully and it allows the body to produce serotonin more successfully as part of the hormone of sleep. So there could be two benefits. One could be in the production of sleep hormone and it can also be in the regulation of blood sugar, both of which could disturb the sleep pattern. So the real key is, you know, understanding if any of that may be going on. And this is bypassing medical conditions like apnea and other things that certainly can affect sleeping patterns. And by the way, one of the best treatments for sleep apnea is effective weight loss. I thought you were going to say one of the best treatments is divorce because my husband has it and it's well, that's another well, well, that's that's true. Well, yes, and you know absolutely. we do have that's a great point you bring up because we do have people that like different temperatures of the room they like different and the fact of the matter is as a rule if you're really looking at sleep preparation the room should be as cold and dark as you can make it mm. uh, but some people you know they get they have more sensitive to cold they want it warmer some want it cooler so if you're sleeping with someone in the same bed it, in the same room, it could be a problem. And you want no, and this is important, no blue or green screens on in those rooms. There's only one light that, or one color light that can actually be on in a nightlight, and that would be more of a reddish hue because it will trigger melatonin release. And I want to, let me address melatonin because this I is something- I was just gonna say, let's also- This is something that comes up melatonin. all the time for me. And yes. Melatonin is not a direct sleep aid. And I'm gonna say it again. It's not to promote sleep per se. Melatonin is the chemical expression in the brain of darkness. The brain doesn't see darkness. When it gets dark, the pineal gland releases melatonin and the brain now knows that it's dark. So what melatonin's best value is, is resetting your 24 hour clock if you're traveling through different time zones. That's when it has its greatest impact. This idea of constantly taking melatonin as a sleep aid is really a dangerous approach because whenever you're taking an endpoint hormone like that, you're urging the body to stop making its own. 
And as adults, we're not producing a lot of melatonin to begin with because the pineal kind of atrophies a little bit with age. So if you're taking a lot of melatonin routinely, you can interfere with the body's natural ability to get into the rhythm of sleep effectively long-term. And that's always the problem we have. We always look for these short-term gains and not look at the long-term ramification. And just because it's a, 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 an amino acid or it's a protein or it's an herb, don't be misled into thinking it may not have long-term negative effects on a cycle. We know the problems with medication, and I'll address those in just a little bit. But I want people to realize that if you're taking melatonin or you're giving, and now parents are giving huge amounts of melatonin to their children, it's a huge mistake. Uh, and, and, you, and if you are taking it that way, give it a period where you stop it for a couple of weeks or a month and then pick it up with low dose. But do not keep taking high doses of melatonin. It is not a direct sleep aid. It is more to reset your biological clock so that you can ease into the time zone that you're living in more effectively. Um, so yeah, and I just I love, wanted to I make love, that point. Yeah, I think that's so important, Frank. And I was gonna say, you know, I love what the point you're making about endpoint hormones. So the better thing to do is to allow your body to create its own levels of melatonin. And just circling back to what we were talking about regarding food. So there are certain foods, again, making this a very practical session, there are certain foods that will actually facilitate uh, the production of just the right levels. We're talking real Goldilocks uh, chemistry here, just the right levels of melatonin that you need. So for example, dark cherries are a wonderful source uh, that will actually act as a precursor to enable your body to produce the right levels of, of sleep producing or sleep promoting hormones. Um, you've and, and dark signaling hormones, as, as Frank was saying about melatonin, but also things like oats, banana, um, brown rice is another one. It's very interesting. These are, are complex carbohydrates a, a lot of the time. Um, personally speaking, I find half a banana before bedtime works an absolute treat for me. It keeps my blood sugar level just stable enough to get me through the night. My, I'm very, my sleep, personally speaking, is very, very sensitive. So, you know, I sort of, I know whereof I speak on this particular topic. I mean, you, you can sleep on a fence because you're very good at sleeping. Although you've been through uh, stages no, in your been, life, uh, haven't you? Look. Where Look, the, the, the country, believe it or not, 80% of our population has what's called transient insomnia, and 15 to 20 have literally chronic insomnia, yeah. that it's almost impossible to sleep. So we're talking about something of epidemic proportions, if you think about it. I mean, 80% plus is of transient insomnia, and for some people, transient could be several times a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, I so... Well, well, that brings up a good point with one of the live viewers named Joyce, who asks, if somebody shows symptoms of sleep apnea, should they make the effort to get a sleep study to see if they have it and then take care of it? Without any question. Uh, and here's the key to that. Um, again, what they will find is that generally speaking, that can occur with anxiety and other reasons, but many times it occurs where the airway is being affected by huge volume of fat and fatty tissue. That's why when we have people that are snoring sometimes or that people that have apnea, you know, some significant weight loss or at least initial weight loss can actually change that significantly. But if you're having episodes of oxygen deprivation like apnea, you need to do a sleep study and it should be checked out and it should be evaluated. And not that I love CPAP machines, but sometimes there may be the necessity to do that. And it should be checked medically if it's an ongoing issue because you don't want to have that apnea affecting your sleeping pattern over long periods of time because it will increase the risk of diabetes, heart disease, and other kinds of conditions. And we don't want that to happen. Now, the, other, the other thing about sleep prep is that, you know, you we talked about the body being in a cool environment. This is where taking a really hot bath before bedtime has value for people that have anxiety and tension with their beginning sleep because there will be a reactive cooling effect of the body when they get into bed. So taking a hot bath at bedtime, and if they even want to do some additional relaxation, they can do it with Epsom salts because the magnesium sulfate will actually absorb through the skin and it'll create an anti-anxiety effect. It'll allow a little bit of muscle relaxation while they're easing into sleep, uh, sleepfulness from the wakeful state. So, you know, the hot bath, all of those kinds of things do have some value, keeping the room dark and cool, no screens, no green screens. And the other piece is 
you know, we advocate a strong amount of uh, intimacy. The bedroom should be designed for two things, sleep and sex, not watching the 11 o'clock news where you're counting the number of hangings that have gone on in your community that day. You know, you want really wonderful winding down behavior. And there's no question that general intimacy and sexual behavior is also useful for sleep because it's activating a whole level of hormonal releases uh, that are wonderful in sleep. And you want to avoid alcohol and caffeine in evening hours completely. And if you think about it, most people, if you were going to drink alcohol, you're better off drinking it sometime early in the day. But the people that tend to do that tend to be alcoholics. So I would avoid doing alcohol at night. And there is another transmitter called adenosine, which is involved with easing into sleep in the early phase. Unfortunately, caffeine completely interferes with that hormone and it blocks that hormone. So that's another reason why any form of caffeine can be problematic in the evening. That even includes chocolate, that includes tea, that includes you know sodas, coffee, all of it. My advice is to go caffeine-free. If you're having any anxiety or sleep problems, you need to eliminate that because it's gonna reinforce anxiety. It's gonna reinforce exhaustion and depression. Great. Also, sorry, sorry, AJ, carry on. No, I, yeah, well, Jean, who's watching live, wanted to know, do naps count? Like, can they count towards your the total sleep needed? They can. Yes, they yes. do. You know, and that's why most cultures of the world, think about it, they're civilized. They take nap times. You know, we're the only yes, culture so. that feels that, you know, we that the doing that is kind of, uh, uh, you know, taking away our responsibility to life. It's a huge mistake. We, we need to build in periods of rest and sleep and, and it, I think it's, it's very valuable it's only really since the industrial revolution where we've lived this you know sort of uh, nine to five you know you work you, you get up you have your breakfast you go to work you come home from work and so on you don't take a nap in the middle of the day it's it's absolutely artificial the way that we work the way we live our lives so yes taking a nap even a 20 30 nap. minute power nap can be powerful yeah. I mean, it can really be yeah. rejuvenating regenerating yeah. you know my top tip is uh, if you possibly can if you possibly possibly can if you can lie down three o'clock in the afternoon and lie down with your feet raised your your legs raised perhaps put a couple of pillows under your knees to raise your your legs above your your heart um the reason for that is in traditional chinese medicine it nourishes the kidney energy that's the the time uh for the kidney energy so it's it's again again it's a it's an energetic system of medicine it's a notional system but we do seem to get much more rest bang for our buck when we do that and then the other thing i want to talk about from again a movement perspective is uh one of the things you can do at, don't, don't go to the gym right before you're supposed to be going to bed. But gentle stretching is really, really useful. One of the, I, I would say, go onto YouTube, see if you can find yourself a nice video on restorative yoga, because these techniques are very, very gentle stretches. And it's been shown that these can actually really help you get into that, that uh, sort of rest and digest restorative parasympathetic mode so much more easily. But also the interesting thing about stretching in that particular kind of way is it's been shown to have a massive impact on normalizing blood pressure. I mean, talk about another additional, you know, bang for your buck that's rather unexpected. So again, all of these things that it, I always think it's so wonderful when we sort of step back and we look at the overall holistic impact of everything that we do these these healthy lifestyle changes healthy lifestyle recommendations have so much more impact than we could ever even begin to imagine yeah so the you know getting rid of all the processed junk food is is a critical piece for sleep people don't realize it because you know to have the stable blood sugar that we're talking about across time the whole plant nutrition approach is providing those incredible nutrients and stabilizing minerals and micronutrients when you're deprived of those with junk foods that are loaded with oils and salts and all of these additives, they themselves have, uh, so getting rid of that, really reducing the alcohol and the caffeine, working on these stress response management techniques so that at night, you're not carrying all of that stress to bed with you at night. If you think about it, most of the disruption of sleep at night are people with anxiety, with the inability to quiet that barrel of monkeys that are running around in their heads. And so they, instead of opting for these simple breathing and techniques that Janie just mentioned, 
what's the most common thing that most of these people do? They opt for medication. And I need to address that if you don't mind. I want to take a minute with that because, you know, we have an epidemic, a, 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 a culture that is addicted to sleep meds and anti-anxiety medication. And as it turns out, those are some of the most dangerous addictive medications known to man. So that class of compounds that we call benzodiazepines, like Xanax and Ativan and some of those drugs, or even uh, uh, narcotics like Lunesta and so on. The problem with these drugs is, and and you know, I understand the standpoint of physicians because when they're dealing with people with anxiety, and the less you sleep, the more anxious you get. So it kind of feeds that. Uh, is they're looking for some way to quiet anxiety at bedtime with the idea that the person will ease into sleep. Happen. The problem is, is that just like with some of the other things we spoke about, these drugs interfere with deep delta wave sleep. So the medical mentality is, if you're not getting sleep, I'm going to get you some sleep, but it may not be the restorative, regenerative sleep you really need. So the person never has that cycle of feeling restored, but yet they're now taking these drugs, which by the way, are the most addictive drugs on planet Earth. And they're very difficult to get off of and they feed more anxiety, more depression and so on. And here's an interesting thing. We now know that sleep does two things. Sleep consolidates memory. So good deep restorative sleep helps you remember things that you learn in the daytime. That's one of the ways we consolidate information. And the other thing is that it naturally releases trauma. And that's kind of an intriguing piece because that's what dreaming and some of all of that is about. It's one of the ways that we subconsciously or unconsciously release the trauma of our lives. Now, it's intriguing that people that have post-traumatic stress disorders, like coming back from service or people that have been through major trauma, often have tremendous anxiety and they're put on these anti-anxiety meds as a way to treat PTSD, anxiety, and hopefully get better sleep. What some of the research has now shown is that these drugs not only interfere with the deep phases of sleep, which naturally discharge trauma, but they're allowing the trauma to linger longer in the nervous system. So while the drugs were given for people with traumatic stress disorders, it's actually reinforcing the length of how long that trauma stays in their brain and nervous system. So it's not a good way to go. And taking care of the nutritional and the lifestyle of factors we've talked about, exercise, meditation, breathing, stretching, movement, food, getting rid of alcohol, and all, this is the way you have to give your body a chance to reestablish that rhythm and pattern of healthy sleep. And I know in a culture right now that demands so much and is so frenetic, it seems difficult to do that. But if you set these things in motion, you can find yourself getting back into a rhythm that will support better sleep and your life and health. Great, what about the mouthpiece Dave is asking for sleep apnea? Look, these things, sometimes they're, they're keeping an airway open, they're doing, sometimes it works. I mean, you have a lot of stuff that goes on even with, uh, with dental issues at night with anxiety and grinding and closing and clamping. So yeah, it may have some value, but what I'm talking here about is understanding that no matter what the condition is in the body, in this case, let's take insomnia, there are always a constellation of factors that contribute to that outcome. I don't care if it's heart disease, joint disease, insomnia. What we only typically look at is the endpoint outcome and then some way to just kind of cover that and deal with that one-on-one, -on -one, when in fact the insomnia may be tied into a whole pattern of how we're dealing with the events of our lives, the relationships that we've got going on, this happening, the food we're eating. And what I'm urging is to take a bigger picture of your life. What are those conditions that may be contributing to your factor of insomnia? It's not that you can't take a, a supplement or an herbal thing, but they're not necessarily addressing the cause of your problem. And my feeling is why keep dancing around some of what that is when maybe you need to nail it more head on. Okay, I need to clean this up in my life. I need to be eating more effectively this way. I need to be maybe looking at this more effectively. And I think if you do that, you'll take charge of the process rather than just dancing around the symptom or the expression of a pathological effect while not addressing the causes that contribute to it. 
Great. Thank you. We actually have someone who sent in a question in advance, knowing you would be on. Okay. And, uh, if you guys wouldn't mind answering it, it's about soy. And she says, I often hear soy being recommended for hormonal health and conditions like PCOS or perimenopause. If a person does not eat soy, what other things can they eat to get sufficient phytoestrogens? Any details appreciated? For example, if you're going to recommend flax seeds, how much, how often, or is there another food? Like, I, I wonder this too, because I'm allergic to soy. So am I getting the benefits of it? Okay, well, um, talking about perimenopause and menopause, um, my mom used to make something called the menopause cake, which we touched on last time, AJ. Um, and uh, I've still got to, I've found the recipe and I'm going to put it up on my website. So I'll do that actually later today. Uh, there are obviously flaxseed um, lignans in, in that particular recipe, um, but it's also got all sorts of other, we were talking about sort of precursors and supporting phytonutrients that actually kind of create this constellation of goodies that's, that help us. So uh, we've got things like oats, uh, we've got things like chia seeds in there and, and so on. What else uh, can people actually use, Frank? It's kind, um, it's kind of intriguing. Instead of soy. There are data suggesting that the body Body's natural production of EPA and the omega-3 family declines in menopause. So making sure that the ALA, the alpha linolenic acid content of the diet is high. For example, even three walnuts, three and a half walnuts is all the ALA requirement for a human body in a day. You need between one and one and a half grams of ALA. The body will naturally produce EPA from that. But again, Increasing ALA content, as Jeannie mentioned, in flaxseed, uh, ground flaxseed, walnut, greens, legumes, all of that will be helpful. There's not a reason to have to eat soy to provide the isoflavones that support the body. So my feeling is if you like it and you want to have some of it, just make sure it's organic because it is one of the most genetically modified and herbicided crops on the planet. And sometimes having it in a little bit of a fermented form could be valuable, like tempeh or something, miso or something in that regard. But if you're having some flaxseed, if you're having a little bit of walnut and greens, I wouldn't worry about it. And I don't feel that there's an absolute need to have a processed food like soy. Thank you. Nice. Any other, any other questions? Let me look at the chat. That, that was the one that was sent in. Make sure to put four questions. A lot of talk, talk about sleep apnea in here, which is yeah, okay. it's a big issue. Um, one of the things, uh, AJ, while you're just having a look, one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, all of the sleep coaches that I deal with on a on a sort of pretty much daily basis, because within the Complementary Medical Association, we have a lot of uh, sleep coaches registered with us. Um, and uh, I, I, you can find their details on the CMA website. But one of the things they always impress upon uh, everybody that they work with is the importance of waking up at the same time every day. It's one of the easiest strategies for resetting your, yeah, that's your what we talked sleep about, and going to bed at the same time. Going so to bed, yeah. That rich, more that... important, setting your, oh, okay. your alarm in the morning. Um, and and I hate to say this to everybody, but unfortunately, you, you're going to hate me for this. And at the, at, keep it at the same time at the weekend. Uh, no lions over. The, if you're struggling with sleep, making sure that you're getting up at the same time every day um, is really, really important uh, because that will actually help to dramatically improve your your the way your body clock actually works. So please, if there's one sort of takeaway, that is a really important one. Nice. Thank you. I think we got to all the questions. This, it's fun when you two are together. You, you do a nice compliment to each other. Well, yeah. thank you. Also, this is our 11th anniversary. How about that? Yeah. We get to share it together at this time in June. That's when we met 11 years ago in June. Wow. So how are these long, how, how, what do you think about long distance relationships? Awesome. <laughs> no, well, look, we there, are those, there, are those time, there are those times when, you know, you miss that person being with you. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, you know, we, tr we get together on a regular basis every few months and it's always a honeymoon. So, you know, yeah. that's kind of cool in a way, in its own way. There's a lot to be said for it, AJ, because the thing is, Frank's incredibly busy. I'm incredibly busy. So it enables us to obviously do our, our things out in the world. But as he says, you know, when we do get together, it's absolutely magical. Look, it's got to be really with the person you really want to be with, yeah. because let's face it, there are contingencies that happen with distance that can take people apart. 
So it's got to be someone that's so cool and so important in your life that you can transcend all of that. And, and that's what it is. Let's face it, nobody else would have us. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. But... <laughs> <laughs> they would have us but it's a chore there's no <laughs> it would be a chore there's no question about it they'd have to be very very specialist <laughs> anyway th this was a great opportunity to share yeah. this information this is such an important area and subject that um you know i hope people you know think about these lifestyle factors that can really help them because there are solutions out there that can help you in the way and the things that we've talked about but make no mistake this is a missing link for major health problems for many people and if we can just make the point that it's something that you seriously consider and think about even in your weight loss program then then we've accomplished something right and what a person eats is going to affect how they sleep not just when but what and i know uh, you talk about that totally. a lot you totally think. absolutely and, yeah. and that must be great to be in a relationship with somebody that eats just like you Oh, I, you know, for me, that's a biggie. I love having Huge. people I can eat with, you yeah. know, I, it doesn't work otherwise. Look, yeah. I'm Italian, you know, food is an issue. Let's be realistic. Yeah. You know, food is a major piece. Yeah. So, you know, when I can sit down and we both enjoy those kinds of food, it's lovely to share that. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you guys. It's so great seeing you. Thank you, AJ. We love you, man. Yes. We'll see Same you soon. Here. Thank you. And thank thanks. You. Bye, Lots everybody. Bye. Bye bye. Take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for Dylan and Reeves from Well Your World. They'll be making a cheesy sriracha kale chip, freezer Cuban rice and beans, and Cajun mac and trees. Mac and trees. I don't know what that is. I said mac and cheese. <laughs> mac, I like mac and trees, though. That's great. <laughs> Oh, you, that's funny. A lot of fiber in that. <laughs> who, cooks for, who cooks for who when you guys are together? Who makes the meals when you're together? Well, it it depends. It um, depends on whose house we're yeah, in, actually. Yeah. When she's here, I cook a lot. When yeah. I'm there, she does a lot yeah. of prep. So, yeah. and both yeah. of my sons, I my one of my sons lives here too, and he's a great cook too. So he'll cook too. So that's fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much. Great. Thank to you, see AJ. You. Bye, bye, honey. Well, everyone. Bye. Is